Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm Stacey from the Birmingham City Council Public Health Team, um, and uh, we're leading this Be Healthy work. Um, today is one of our, our webinar series, and today focuses on um, one of long-term conditions and it's high blood pressure focus. Um, I have with me two GPs today who are gonna um, lead the webinar and run through the, the topic details. But before we do that, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of uh, a few housekeeping rules for today. Um, can we move on please, Aruna? And, um, and then talk about be healthy. So in terms of housekeeping, if you haven't, Thank you. In terms of housekeeping, when you're not speaking, um, it, can we please all keep our uh, microphones muted and cameras off? This just helps with the bandwidth and helps the recording um, and the smooth running of everything. If you have any VPNs on your um, computer or laptop, maybe NetMotion or Cisco, it also helps to keep those turned off as well. Um, we really encourage questions and chat. Um, so you will notice that there's a um, chat box, a chat function. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I'll type something when I finish talking. Um, and then if you'd post any questions in there, if you do them when you think of them, it means that they'll be answered and we won't forget them. And it means that you won't forget them either. Um, we do understand that not everybody wants to ask a question live on a webinar. If you have a question that you'd rather ask um, privately, please email it to healthybrum at birmingham.gov.uk and we'll collate a response for you and get it back to you. Um, as we said before we started the recording, today's webinar is recorded um, and it will be available and used as a resource afterwards for people that couldn't be here today or for you to share with your communities. So just before we go on to talking about high blood pressure, um, moving on to the next slide, we can look at um, a quick overview of Be Healthy and why we're doing what we're doing. So um, Be Healthy is a series of, series of practical resources that we've developed um, for use by community leaders. So anybody who's working with a community group of people, the aim is that these resources and webinars can help you to reduce that your community's risk of becoming seriously ill from COVID-19. Um, you can book any of the webinars from the Birmingham City Council um, website. The link is on this slide, but it's also be at the end of this webinar as well. Um, there's a whole series, um, um, some COVID safe messaging, and then focusing on long-term conditions, particularly those that um, are directly linked to COVID and some healthy habits that we'd like to encourage you to do more of, such as physical activity and healthy eating, and some um, webinars that focus on reducing um, um, tendencies and habits that we'd um, like people to do um, less of, so maybe gambling or smoking and things that by stopping you can improve your health. Um, so I think that's the overview of Be Healthy and I think that with that we can hand over to our first speaker. Um, so over to Dr. Satch. Hi, you. Well, uh, thank you very much for um, that introduction and um, I would like to welcome um, everyone to today's meeting but also Alex who's also the other GP will be working with me today uh, we've done some work before in the past around um, atrial fibrillation, so this is something uh, something we're quite passionate about. I'm hoping that you'll be able to pick something up in terms of what we can do in order to help uh, some of the communities out there. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is high blood pressure. Um, next slide. And um, Alex, if you're there, could you just introduce yourself if that's okay, so you can put a face to the person. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Saj. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alex Mayer. I'm a GP in Birmingham, and uh, I'm the um, strategic clinical lead for cardiovascular disease and stroke for Birmingham and Solihull uh, Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, and uh, I've got an interest in, in uh, managing high blood pressure and other cardiac conditions. Um, and so I'm really pleased to be able to, to join you on this webinar today. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, so my name is Sad Sawa. I'm a GP uh, and I work in Aston and uh, I'm also a cardiovascular lead for Sandwell West Birmingham CCG. And one of the reasons why <clears throat> I've been involved in this is, is that um, um, the, some of the public health data that we've had, particularly around our neck of the woods, has actually shown that cardiovascular outcomes are much worse in terms of people dying, um, in terms of uh, deaths from uh, conditions related to cardiovascular disease and um, I was quite passionate in order to make a change and we've done some stuff in the past particularly on stroke prevention as well um, and it's quite nice to know that we work with the likes of Alex Mayer as well and also um, guys at the local hospital who are actually world-class leaders around stroke prevention 
which has actually allowed us to make a, a big impact in terms of preventing strokes. Um, and obviously today, something like blood pressure is very important, which is pertinent to all of us, is something that I think we need to discuss because again, in a way, it's a route to all evil or one of the routes to all evil. Uh, and it's for that reason, we're gonna discuss uh, high blood pressure today. Next slide, please. Um, so the way that we've broken the presentation is into two parts. I do forget, the, uh, do forgive me, there's a police card just gone past, but I'm actually gonna talk about why blood pressure is important, especially uh, not just uh, when we haven't got a pandemic, such as COVID, but other times as well. And what are the health implications of having a high blood pressure? The other thing is, is that we're going to talk about numbers and knowing about some of the numbers. This is one of the things that uh, NHS England is quite keen for us to um, uh, cascade down to practice level. Patients getting to know what's a normal blood pressure when something's high. And also we're going to talk a bit about symptoms and signs of high blood pressure as well. And in particular, we'll be looking at how certain at-risk groups, particularly BAME communities, uh, are on much higher risk of having high blood pressure. Uh, and in particular with COVID, some of the outcomes that are associated with regards to that as well. Um, Alex is going to talk about lifestyle changes and some of the pharmacological managements um, which are which will be involved with. Was there anything else, Alex, that you wanted to say as part of your uh, presentation? Um, no, no, that's fine. You've you've pretty much said what I'm going to be covering. Okay, so um, why is high blood pressure important? The reason why high blood pressure is important. Next slide, please. Is because it's a silent killer. And the reason for that is it's a very dangerous condition um, where the blood pressure is persistently higher than normal. And if we left it untreated, people with hypertension or high blood pressure are more likely to have risk from having a heart attack, a stroke or a kidney failure. And the reason why this is important is because of this. When you look at high blood pressure, we are looking at a condition that a patient may be completely asymptomatic. So they may have a slightly high res blood pressure, but they may not be aware of it. And often it's when it's too late that they present either to the GP or to the hospital, whereby they've had some fatal outcome as a result of having the high blood pressure. And this is the reason why it's a silent killer and we need to be more proactive in trying to identify patients with high blood pressure. And the reason for this next slide is, is because of this. One of the things that we're looking at when we're looking at high blood pressure and looking at heart disease in general is that we can have issues with blocking of your normal arteries. And if you have a look at this diagram on the left hand side, you'll see that there's a normal artery there which has a very good um, uh, lumen which allows blood to flow. And this is easily represented in different parts of the body, in your heart, in your brain, in your kidneys. And then with progression, you can develop fatty streaks. And there's been evidence now that's actually suggested that even children or babies actually can have development of fatty streaks. But the important thing is this, if someone has high blood pressure, sometimes what can happen is you can get a damage to the lining of, that, of the wall, of the inside, which allows a fibrous plaque to form. And when you get that, that's when you get narrowing of the, uh, of the artery or the blood vessel, which then causes you to develop a stenosis or a narrowing, which has an impact in terms of your heart which is why you get angina or chest pain, or you get poor circulation to your legs, which is why you get something called intermittent claudication. But the other aspect that's also related to this, and this is where cholesterol is quite important is, is that you can get the plaque forming and a clot forming. And when you have that clot formed, it can again cause narrowing the airway of the, um, the blood vessels, but it can also cause some of the clot to be disrupted and to be thrown up to different parts of the body. And this is why this results in patients having MIs, which are heart attacks, or a stroke, the new term for this, or the more appropriate term for this is a brain attack, or cardiovascular death, or when you may end up losing your limb because the circulation has been impaired. So you can understand that high blood pressure is one of several different conditions whereby it contributes to atherosclerosis. And by having high blood pressure, what it essentially does is, is accelerates the process. So it means that patients who have this condition are more likely to have problems in terms of having a heart attack or a brain attack or even death with regards to the above. Next slide, please. So if we just put it into the main organs that we're talking about in terms of high blood pressure, the main organs that can be affected can include the heart. So you can get a damage to a certain supply of the heart, which isn't getting enough 
blood supply, which means as a result of that, the heart will end up having ischemia where the blood supply is uh, deprived. But if there's damage to the blood supply, where the da there's damage, sorry, to the heart, then what they'll end up having is a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. You can also get something happening in renal failure, and this is particularly relevant for people who have blood pressure over a longer period of time. And what it essentially means is, is that small blood vessels of the kidneys become damaged over a period of time, and that in itself can cause problems, because what it means is the kidneys aren't working as well as they should. And sometimes when I speak to my patients, I use analogy of a catalyst. So, you know, if you have a car, you have a catalyst in the exhaust that attracts all the bad fumes. And if you have high blood pressure, what actually happens is you damage the catalyst of your kidneys, which means it can't work as well as it should. If you're looking at cerebrovascular accidents, what they're talking about this is, I know it's a lot of terms, but when you have disruption or damage to the supply of the brain, if you have smaller vessel damage over a period of time, that's one of the conditions such as dementia that is becoming more and more manifest. But also if you have a larger amount of blood vessel which is affected with a larger distribution, you can end up getting either a mini stroke or where you have a end result of having a fatal stroke, a stroke whereby you're left with a disability. And again, you can also get larger blood vessels affected such as the aorta, which is the main blood vessel leaving your heart where you have an aneurysm and that in itself is determined by high blood pressure and can cause problems as well. Next slide, please. So one of the things I've talked about is knowing your numbers. And this is something that came across, I came across several years ago. And it's quite interesting because one of the things I mentioned earlier on in the slides is, is with high blood pressure, a lot of the time we won't know about it because it's silent. We don't have any problems with it. And it's only if we develop complication with it that we then are then, um, uh, then we decide that we need to seek advice from a doctor or go to the hospital. And the reason for that is a third of the population has high blood pressure, but they don't know it. A third of the population who have hypertension or high blood pressure are not taking any treatment at all. And the, a third of the population who are taking treatment are not taking treatment enough to control the blood pressure reading. Next slide, please. So one of the things that's come out recently uh, over the last year or so is one of the ways that we actually look at high blood pressure. And if you press the slide one more time, please, these are the different stages of blood pressure, okay? And what we've tried to do, or what uh, um, researchers try to identify is, is trying to address those people that we need to make an intervention. So if you look at the top reading, which is 135 over 85. Now, sometimes people get confused about the readings and it's, and it's COVID has been quite good uh, for patients and for us because what's it allowed us to do is give an element of empowerment. So one of the things that a lot of my patients started doing is getting blood pressure machines at home and they give me readings. And often they get the readings confused between the pulse and the top blood pressure being the bottom reading. But essentially the top reading of your blood pressure is when your heart is contracting or squeezing to form blood out of your heart to go to the rest of the body. And so the blood pressure ideally should be below 135. Now, when your heart is relaxed, there's still a cellular element of blood that's going out and that's the bottom blood pressure, which is 85. Out of the two blood pressure readings, the top one is much more important. When you look at stage one hypertension, you see the reading of the top one should be between 135 to 149 and the bottom one should be between 85 to 94. The important thing at this stage is, is that if that patient has other risk factors that suggest that they're at high risk of having heart disease, in terms of if they have high cholesterol, if they're overweight, if they're smoking, et cetera, that puts them at risk, then there's advice that these patients should be on blood pressure medication in order to reduce their blood pressure. Because as I mentioned, blood pressure is a strong determinant of heart disease and stroke disease, which I'll touch upon in the next few slides. If your blood pressure is greater than 150 over 91, 95, then it suggests that again, they should be untreated irrespective. And obviously with a blood pressure of 180 or 120, this is where you need, or you may require urgent hospital involvement because at this stage you need input because there's a risk that you could have some severe damage. Next slide, please. So the interesting thing about high blood pressure is in 95% of cases of high blood pressure, we don't know what the cause is. And it's only about 5% that it happens 
whereby you're getting as a result of other conditions, such as because of your kidneys, because of hormone problems, because of medications that you might be taking. So as I touched upon earlier, next slide, in terms of signs and symptoms of blood pressure, one of the most important contribution to cardiovascular disease is high blood pressure. We touched upon earlier on about other conditions such as high cholesterol and atrial fibrillation as well. But one of the things that we're talking about is why high blood pressure is important because it's a root of the evils with cardiovascular disease. And when we talk about cardiovascular disease, it's a general term that we look at for conditions affecting your heart or the blood vessels around the body. So this can include your heart, circulatory diseases, including the heart, heart attacks, congenital heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, and even dementia as well. So when, when you have high blood pressure, as well as cholesterol or atrial fibrillation, these are known as a high risk conditions, ABC. And it's something that's been actually recognized at a strategy level that we need to cascade down to practice level, but also community level to make patients aware that these are the things that we need to look for. And today's webinar, obviously, as you know, is about high blood pressure. And this is why we're focusing on this condition today. But the problem is often you only get symptoms when the damage has started. And this is why it's important that we screen for high blood pressure and for patients who have high blood pressure that they're being adequately treated. So next slide. One of the most important documents um, that came out over the last few years is something called the NHS long-term plan. And the main reason this came out was because of two factors. Number one, we have an aging population. People are living longer. And a result of people living longer, they're carrying larger comorbidities, which means more people have high blood pressure, more people have a better lifestyle, more people have high cholesterol, and more people are likely to have AF. And we have to take this into account because it can imagine the impact on the healthcare system will be dramatic. There's another element to this as well. And the other element was essentially this. We have a workforce crisis, okay? So you're having now GPs who are retiring, which means that there's a larger vacuum of GPs, particularly in the city areas, whereby we're not getting the GPs or the healthcare that we need. And it's for that reason that we're trying to get more doctors to be educated, uh, to graduate, which can support that. But this is why we've also started thinking outside the box and thought about including uh, pharmacists. We thought about including social prescribers. We think about involving other nurses in order who can come and support the primary care um, pathway. And this is why one of the things that you may have heard is about the development of primary care networks, whereby there's a lot of investment into these networks in order to provide a much more better uh, um, su a supported pathway for these patients as well. We're also working much more closely with voluntary care organizations. Next slide, please. So one of the things the long-term plan looked at was it identified that cardiovascular disease is a clinical priority. And it's the single best, biggest condition where lives can be saved by the NHS over the next 10 years. It seek the ambition that we want to prevent 150,000 heart attacks, strokes, and dementia cases over the next 10 years. And the most important thing is we need to partner with voluntary and community sector and other organizations in order to meet this ambition. And if I just go back to this slide, the reason for that is, is, and you may have seen some of the stuff that's happened. You'll see now that you can get defibrillators on the high street, which may not have been a few years ago. You may have seen that now you can actually have stands whereby you can have your blood pressure checked if you're going out on your Saturday morning prior to COVID uh, in terms of doing um, uh, some proactive screening. And also some of this stuff is being done by the pharmacist as well. Next slide, please. So if we're looking at deprived populations, Next slide, please. Yeah, you'll see that one in four premature deaths is because of cardiovascular disease, okay? And that in itself can cause an impact in terms of deprived populations. Sorry, it's the slide before. Yeah. Slide before, that's it. Um, and we know that cardiovascular disease can affect about 7 million people. And this is a really interesting uh, statistic. Sorry, next slide. As in, pro slide after. Next. No, no, you're going backwards, forwards, please. Sorry.
we just got the long, that's uh, slide after this. Yeah. So the middle statistic is very, very important. And this is very, very important if you look at what this slide says. And the statistic is when we get to it, is that people in the most 10% uh, deprived population are almost twice as likely to die from cardiovascular disease than those in the least deprived 10% of the population. So what we're talking about is cardiovascular disease affects more people who are deprived compared to the people who are least deprived. Uh, no, it's a slide before, please. Yeah, and you're more at risk of cardiovascular disease if you have diabetes, if you have a family history, or if you're from, uh, if you're a smoker and you feel from ethnic minority. And again, this slide is quite pertinent because what we're looking at is, is reversible risk factors and factors that you can't change. So if you have diabetes, you cannot change that, okay? If you have a family history, you can't change your family. If you're a smoker, well, yes, you can change your smoking habits, but stop smoking. And if you're from an ethnic group, then you can't change that, okay? But the other thing we also need to look into is mental health. People who have mental health have a life expectancy which is up to 20 years lower than the general population. And one of the reasons why that happens is, is because a lot of the time they're so involved in looking at the patient's mental health that we don't actually look into the other aspects of the health that are important, such as cardiovascular disease, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, and even things around screening for cancers as well, which as a result, this is another deprived population that is suffering because of, um, uh, of this, um, uh, this therapeutic approach. Next slide, please. So as well as having the challenges that we have um, with everything in terms of uh, 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 resources, in terms of GPs, in terms of workforce crisis, in fact, of the patients living longer, recently, we've had a new challenge with COVID. Next slide, please. And the thing about COVID is, is this, and this is a really interesting slide, which is actually um, looked at mortality from COVID um, after a previous illness. So what they did is they looked at patients who died um, on cardiovascular disease. And what they wanted to do was, was they wanted to work out um, what was their main condition that led them um, to, to have, uh, have a death. And this was uh, from uh, the W Health Organization looking at the China deaths. And what you will see is, is that patients who had cardiovascular disease who had diabetes and high blood pressure were more likely to die compared to respiratory and cancer. And this is something which has really changed the way that we looked at COVID as a disease because it is a relatively new condition that we're not familiar with. And the reason for that is purely this. Normally when you develop these type of conditions and as SARS stands for acute respiratory syndrome, you tend to get symptoms related to your lungs, okay? And this is why it's quite um, interesting this slide because what it's showing is there's an underlying reason to why patients with cardiovascular disease are more likely to die. And I'll touch upon that in a minute. So this is something that's really changed that, that we started thinking about COVID. This next slide is quite important because it looks at um, a, a study that was published in the European Heart Journal. And it looked at how many patients with high blood pressure died compared to those without. So if you look on your right hand side, you look at the top um, uh, um, uh, bar and looks at your patients who have high blood pressure and you'll see that if they had high blood pressure, okay, then they would be more likely to be severely unwell with the result of having COVID and they would end up being ventilated and a certain number of them would end up dying. But the interesting thing is this, if you look at the ones who had no medication, those are the ones that basically had no treatment and were not being looked after. If you look at the red bar, they would do much worse in terms of dying compared to the ones who were hypertensive and even more so with people who didn't have high blood pressure at all. And if you have a look at the ones that were critical, you can also actually also see is the similar uh, story with the orange bar as well. And if you compare that with the no hypertension, you can see the bars are much more smaller. So what this really showed was was that if you have high blood pressure, which was not treated, you would do much worse compared to a patient with no high blood pressure at all. Next slide, please. 
And this was a study that was published by the CDC uh, looking at the 72,000 patients in China. And again, what it identifies is that if you have hyperpetuary diabetic and heart disease, you will end up doing much worse. Next slide, please. And so th there's, there's been a lot of studies that have been happening over the course uh, of the last few, few months since we've had this pandemic. And in particular, uh, this was a study that looked at um, patients within the new uh, New York City precinct. And what they actually found out was that um, if you had COVID, okay, if you were a diabetic, you were a third more likely to die or have complications. If you were overweight, you were 40% more likely um, to end up being placed on a ventilator. But look at the interesting thing. If you have high blood pressure, you're 60% more likely to have complications. And the reason why we, feel, we think um, that COVID has impact on people who have cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure or diabetes is to do the fact that what we've realized is, is something's happening at a, at a molecular level, at a clotting level, which means that they're more likely to form a clot. The clot is actually gonna end up being dispersed to different parts of the body. And as a result, they'll end up getting kidney damage or having clots in their lungs, which causes them to have the ultimate demise. And if you particularly look at children, it's been identified, and this kind of reinforces that theory, that sometimes you can get a variant of having a rash on, on their limbs, which suggests that it's something to do with a clotting disorder. And this is why COVID in itself is a big challenge because it is a relatively new virus, but what has identified uh, coming out of this is, is that if you have uh, any of the following in terms of high blood pressure, diabetes, or you're overweight, then it puts you at much higher risk of having a worse outcome. Next slide, please. So why is it that BAME groups are much higher risk? And um, if you look at determinants of health, there's a variety of reason why a certain individual or a family of individuals uh, may have a better health outcome compared to others. And this might be to do with the fact in terms of their age, in terms of their sex, in terms of hereditary, it may be to do with genetics. It might be the social network of people that they live with, whether it's a lower deprivation or high deprivation, whether it's related to education or not. It might be related to their eating habits or exercise in terms of them living in a peaceful existence with less stress or whether they're taking alcohol or smoking tobacco. On top of that, there's other aspects in terms of aspects around um, uh, the quality of the food that they're having, whether they got the financial stability, how well educated they are, even in terms of them commuting, whether they're actually using a bus or a car to commute with, or whether they're actually working, sorry, walking or cycling to work. And obviously there's also another determinant of health in terms of a higher level of what's happening economically. So the point is, is that for any set group of patients, the determinants of health are not based on one aspect, but actually due to a very um, large complex, um, con uh, confusing even, and we've been able to identify some consistencies and why some groups are, are, have worse outcomes than others, but it's quite a complicated topic. Next slide, please. So what the next slide looks at is, and this is very complicated, but try to bear with me, okay? On the left-hand side, you've got a, a bar chart that looks at a white population with different age groups. And what you'll see is, is that each bar represents a different condition in terms of how patients suffer um, from that particular condition for that simple, for that age. Um, and that compares it with a middle bar, which are for South Asian communities. So we are looking at India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and then on the far right with a black population. And what you will see is, is that for the South Asian population in the middle, the bar charts are a lot higher than the ones compared to the black population, which is a lot higher than the ones compared to the white population. And what that's suggesting to us is, is patients who are from a South Asian community will do much worse if they have cardiovascular disease in terms of them having a problem with a mortality from a heart attack or a stroke, in terms of them suffering from suggestions such as heart failure, in terms of them having other causes, deaths caused from cardiovascular disease. And you can see that South Asian populations tend to be much worse than the black population, who then tend to be slightly better 
than the white population. Next slide, please. So this slide um, looks at why BAME um, populations did much worse um, compared to uh, a white population, particularly when they picked up COVID. So we know that generally, if you have cardiovascular disease, you'll do much worse. We know that high blood pressure is a strong contributor to, high, uh, to cardiovascular disease as well. And we know that, that when we looked at a lot of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the statistics of patients who were doing much worse with COVID, a lot of these people had cardiovascular disease. But this is quite interesting because it looked at males and females and it compares how patients did compared to the white population. And if you look at the top part, which looks at males, you will see that for if you're black or Bangladeshi or Pakistani, your risk of dying from COVID is up to two times more likely compared to the white population. And it's similar for in the Indian population, we're nearly being up to one and a half times more likely with Chinese uh, subgroups not having much of an impact because it crosses the line in the middle, yet some that actually um, was just as likely, if not less likely, and the same with mixed population. And you can see in the slide before for the females, the pattern is pretty much consistent across both sexes. So essentially what this slide is trying to show is, is that if you are from a BAME ethnic group, compared to the white population, you're up to two times more likely to die from the complications of COVID compared to the white population counterpart. Next slide, please. So th this slide is something that I picked up from South Africa, actually. And you know, even we're talking about a, a country in Africa, you can see that from a public health point of view, they're making such a big effort in order to um, get patients of high blood pressure to control, uh, uh, control their blood pressure readings. And you know, this is something that was kind of promoted to patients um, at, at, at population level by saying that, look, if you've got high blood pressure, you're much higher risk of having COVID, okay? And remember at the start, I talked about reversible factors and I talked about the fact that if you were Asian or from a BAME group, that if you were um, of the family history, if you were male, all these things put you at higher risk. But unfortunately, these factors are irreversible. But if you're a smoker and you have high blood pressure, potentially you can reduce your risk by stopping smoking and controlling your blood pressure a lot better. So the, the theme of this um, presentation was, was to say, look, if you have got a high blood pressure, this is how you can protect yourself. Stay at home as much as possible. Try to take your medications when you're supposed to take them. Make sure that you have enough supply of the medication as well and contact your uh, healthcare provider if you're concerned. So it's quite enlightening really that yeah, in, in Africa, they've actually started to push this um, disease area, particularly in light of what we've discussed uh, with COVID. Next slide, please. I think, Alex, the floor's over to you now. Okay, thank you very much, Saj. Um, so really interesting to hear about uh, the impact of ethnicity and um, blood pressure and other, uh, other conditions on, um, on COVID outcomes. I'm going to talk um, a little bit more about the management of high blood pressure. Uh, so I'm going to focus first of all on um, lifestyle factors, uh, and then I'm going to talk a bit about medication to treat high blood pressure. In terms of lifestyle factors, um, so what I'm going to talk about isn't just important for people who've got high blood pressure. Um, it's, it's good advice for, for anyone, really. Um, so it helps to lower the blood pressure, but it also helps people who don't have high blood pressure to stay healthy. Uh, and if we follow these lifestyle um, uh, factors, um, then we can reduce the blood pressure. And, um, you know, some patients with high blood pressure may not need medication as a result. The aim of uh, treating high blood pressure is um, to reduce the pressure that the heart has to um, pump under, uh, and that then takes pressure off the, the circulation and the vital organs. And we know that by doing that, we can reduce the risk of some of the complications that Saj has talked about, like heart attack, stroke, and kidney failure. Um, so if I can have the next slide, please. So one of the most important lifestyle factors in managing um, high blood pressure is diet. Uh, and there's a very good diet to follow called the DASH diet. So those are dietary uh, strategies to reduce hypertension. And as you can see from the picture, the DASH diet is generally um, uh, high in um, fruit and vegetables, most important, 
Uh, it's low in saturated fats and cholesterol, uh, and it's higher in not in low fat dairy products like yogurt and skim, skim milk. And there's very little uh, saturated fat that you would get from animal fats, from chocolates and sweets and things like that. Um, and so diet's very important. The other, the other thing is um, salt. So people with high blood pressure should limit their salt intake to about six grams or just under a teaspoon a day. And the reason for that is because when we eat salt, the salt draws water in with it. And the more salt and water there is in, in your circulation, the harder the heart has to pump in order to get the blood around the circulation. So it does drive the blood pressure up. And so lowering the salt in your diet can help to lower your blood pressure. Next slide, please. Exercise. So at the, in, in the UK, it's recommended that adults should do 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity. And that doesn't have to be organized sports. Um, it can be simple things like getting off the, the, uh, the bus one stop early or taking the stairs rather than using a, a, a lift. Um, but anything you can do to, to sort of be more active and spend an 150 minutes a week or two and a half hours doing moderate intensity activity. And that's the sort of activity that should leave you feeling slightly out of breath, um, but not very out of breath. Next slide, please. Alcohol is an important factor in managing high blood pressure. So it's recommended that women should have no more than one alcoholic drink per day, and men should have no more than two alcoholic drinks per day. So that's um, seven units per week for, for women, 14 units per week for men. Uh, and you can see on the, um, on the slide what constitutes one alcoholic drink or one unit of alcohol. It's also recommended that um, people should have three alcohol-free days per week. Um, and alcohol not only uh, raises the blood pressure, but it's also high in sugars uh, and it um, provides extra calories. So it um, contributes to weight gain. Next slide, please. Weight loss is another important lifestyle factor. We know that losing as little as 10 pounds or four and a half kilograms can help to lower uh, your blood pressure. And it's one of the lifestyle factors that your doctor or nurse would talk to you about if, um, if you are diagnosed with high blood pressure. Um, the other thing is that um, the distribution of excess weight seems to be important in, in risk of cardiovascular disease. So people who carry more fat around their tummy, uh, so-called apple shape, um, are more likely to have cardiovascular disease than people who carry more fat around their hips and thighs. Uh, so waist circumference is also an important marker. Uh, and people should know their waist circumference. So that's, um, that's their waist size. Uh, for men, it should be less than 40 inches. And for women, it should be less than 35 inches. And uh, waist circumference above those levels seems to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. You should also know your body mass index. So the body mass index is a calculation that's used by healthcare professionals to tell if someone is underweight, um, healthy weight, overweight or obese. Uh, and that's calculated by dividing the weight in kilograms um, by the height um, in meters multiplied by itself. Um, and essentially a healthy weight is between 20 and uh, 25 kilograms per meter squared. Uh, and a weight above 25 can increase blood pressure and increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, next slide, please. Caffeine is important in driving blood pressure. Um, so the more caffeine you drink, the, the harder the, your heart has to pump to get the, the blood around your circulation. And so it's recommended to limit caffeine intake um, to under four cups a day. And don't forget caffeine is also in tea and many fizzy drinks um, like cola. Next slide. Smoking is one of the, the most important things we can do, not only to help people with high blood pressure, but to manage cardiovascular disease in general. Nicotine, um, it, it causes the arteries to narrow uh, and it causes the heart to have to work harder. And we know that people who quit smoking reduce their risk of having a heart attack within 24 hours of quitting. So it's, it's extremely important. Um, and as Saj mentioned earlier, it's very much implicated in the development of these unstable plaques in the arteries that can then lead to um, blockage of the arteries, which cause heart attacks and strokes. Next slide. Sometimes lifestyle changes aren't enough. Um, and when a patient is diagnosed with high blood pressure, the first thing that will happen is they'll have uh, um, some tests done. So they should be examined by their GP. 
Uh, they should have their pulse checked. They should um, have their heart listened to for any signs of heart disease or heart murmurs. Uh, they should then go on to have some blood tests to look for what we call target organ damage. So that includes testing of the um, kidney function. Uh, the urine should also be tested for signs of blood or protein. Uh, that can also be a marker that there might be uh, kidney damage. Uh, the doctor should examine the patient's eyes because um, high blood pressure can affect the blood vessels in the back of the eyes. And by shining a light into the back of your eyes, you can actually see how healthy um, the arteries are. Uh, an ECG is also done when a patient is diagnosed with high blood pressure. That's an electrocardiogram, um, which is a, a test that's very easy to do. It uh, doesn't, doesn't hurt at all, and it only takes about five minutes or 10 minutes to do. Uh, and it gives information about the electrical activity in the heart, but also about how large the, um, the main ventricle in the heart might be. And based on these tests, it gives the doctor a very good idea about whether um, the patient is likely to require um, medical treatment or lifestyle treatment or, or both. So there are some patients that will automatically be started on blood pressure treatment. And on the left, you can see patients who've got a blood pressure above 120 over 180 will need to start blood pressure medication immediately. There are some patients who have a, a cause for their blood pressure. It might be um, a condition um, like um, there are some weird and wonderful things like renal artery stenosis, Conn syndrome. These are um, rare conditions, but they need to be thought about, particularly in young uh, patients with high blood pressure. And so some specialized tests may be required. And for those patients, they're more likely to require treatment. If there's evidence of what we call target organ damage, so that's um, either the heart has become swollen, the kidneys appear to be damaged, there's evidence of eye disease, or if the cardiovascular risk, so the percentage likelihood of developing heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years, if that risk score is above 20%, then the, the, um, the doctor will usually want to start treatment sooner rather than later. We also have a cutoff, as, as Saj mentioned, um, for what's called stage two hypertension. So if the, if, if the blood pressure is consistently or on average above 150 over 95, then the chances are you're gonna need to, to go on blood pressure medication. Uh, next slide, please. So the choice of uh, blood pressure medication is, um, is not random. Um, your doctor will hopefully be using uh, this set of guidelines from the British, Heart, um, British Hypertension Society and the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. And um, broadly speaking, uh, the doctor will pick um, the most suitable medication to lower the blood pressure. Now, it's very important if, when people are diagnosed with high blood pressure that they understand um, what high blood pressure is, why it needs to be treated, um, and how long it's likely to, to need treatment for. And invariably, patients who start medication for blood pressure will need to stay on it for the, for the long term, possibly for the rest of their lives. So it's really important that they understand it and that they get to ask as many questions as they need to at the time. Because if they do, then they're more likely uh, to, to carry on with their medication and take it as prescribed. Um, in terms of choosing the medication, um, so the, it, it sort of depends on some of the, the factors um, for, for each individual, individual patient. So for patients who are younger, those under 55, we tend to use the A drugs. Uh, and these drugs um, help to reduce the pressure of the blood coming through the kidneys. Uh, and the kidneys have a very important role in, in maintaining our blood pressure and keeping our blood pressure um, at a stable level. So the, the A drugs help to take some pressure off the kidneys and allow the blood to, to uh, run through the circulation at a, at a lower pressure. They are better for young, younger patients and they're particularly good for patients who have high blood pressure and diabetes or high blood pressure and kidney disease. Um, then on the right hand side for uh, patients who are over 55, we tend to start with one of the C drugs. And this is also for people who are um, Afro-Caribbean origin. For some reason, the A drugs tend to work less well in, in people who are of Afro-Caribbean origin. Mm -hmm. And so for, the, for these patients, we tend to start with one of the C drugs. And these work quite differently to the A drugs. They actually work by relaxing um, the muscles that run through your blood vessels. And that means that the heart doesn't have to pump quite so um, forcefully to get the blood around the circulation. And so those can work very effectively. 
It's important to understand that managing blood pressure might require um, increasing dose of medication or the use of more than one medication. And so what you can see at step two is that if one blood pressure medication is not adequate to control the blood pressure, then the doctor will add in a second medication. And as you can see, for the patients who had an A drug, um, if they need another tablet, then they'll be offered a C drug. And for those who started on a C drug, then they will be offered an A drug, unless there's a reason that they can't um, ha have one of those medications. If the blood pressure is still Sorry, I've lost my screen. Can you hear me? We can still hear you, even if you can't see. Okay, unfortunately I've lost all, all the slides. Okay, um, what I might have to do is um, just <laughs> talk through it. Um, okay, so after the A and C drugs, um, if the blood pressure is still not controlled, then we might need to use um, what's called a, a, a B drug, and these are uh, tend to be um, water tablets, uh, and they work by reducing uh, salt in, in the system. Uh, and by reducing salt in the system, it uh, means that the arteries don't have to um, uh, that the heart doesn't have to pump quite as hard to get the blood around the circulation um, but patients may notice that they that they're passing more urine um, and so if if uh, the patient is then on three drugs and their, their blood pressure is still not well controlled then they may uh, need to um, be started on a fourth medication at that point they're considered to have uh, what's called resistant hypertension uh, and then um, they may need uh, a bit more specialist input uh, if you just bear with me for a second, I'm going to try and open the set of slides myself so I can see where I'm supposed to be. Sorry about this. Okay, so just moving on to uh, the next slide. It's really important that people understand how to take their, how to take their medication. As I said, starting um, medication for blood pressure is, is usually um, for the long term. Uh, and so it's really important to involve um, family or carers in decision making um, and ask as many questions as you need to if you're a healthcare professional. The medication should usually be taken at the same time each day. Sometimes it will be a once daily medication. Sometimes it will be, need to be taken twice or three times a day. Try not to miss any doses because even missing a single dose can cause the blood pressure to go up. It's also important to read the leaflet before uh, starting the medication so that you have a good understanding of how the medication works and what potential side effects to look out for. For example, for some blood pressure medication, um, if you're feeling unwell or you've developed diarrhea or vomiting, the medication should actually be stopped until you're feeling better. And if you don't know to do that, then you might carry on taking the medication and that can cause you to become more unwell. If you're not sure about how to take your medication or you've got further questions, um, you can uh, consult your, your pharmacist or your GP. All the lifestyle changes that have been advised before starting medication should continue. And it's really important not to stop doing those things because of starting medication. Even those patients who do require medication to, to manage their blood pressure, will certainly do better if they um, are very careful about managing the lifestyle factors as well. It's a good idea to keep a list of the medication that you're taking and the doses. Uh, and you could even consider taking a picture of the, the uh, medication boxes on your phone uh, or just having a list on your phone so that if you need to speak to another healthcare professional who doesn't have access to your medical records, they can see what medication you're taking. Sometimes, taking over-the-counter medication doesn't mix very well with blood pressure tablets. So it's worth mentioning before um, you take anything that's not prescribed, uh, what medication you're taking. A good example of that is ibuprofen, which um, can actually uh, raise your blood pressure. Attending for checkups is extremely important. The reason your doctor will call you for an annual checkup is because the blood tests and other checks that are done uh, are there to look for any complications um, of high blood pressure and to make sure that the medication is still suiting you and that you're not getting any 
um, problems with kidneys, um, cholesterol, diabetes, anything like that. So um, it, it is really important to attend those for those checks. And what's also really helpful is um, to have your own blood pressure machine uh, and to keep an eye on your blood pressure at home and bring the readings written down with you to your, to your checkups. Uh, we know that clinic blood pressure readings, so when your doctor takes your blood pressure or the nurse in, in, your, in your surgery or at the hospital takes your blood pressure, it's bound to be higher than it is when you're at home. And it's actually much better for us to make decisions about managing blood pressure based on the home readings <clears throat> than on the clinic or hospital readings. Because if your blood pressure is high because you're feeling anxious or stressed, then that's not representative of, um, of what your blood pressure normally is. So you can help your, your doctor or, or nurse by bringing the blood pressure readings to you, to, to your appointment. Um, okay, next slide, please. Oh no, I've... Right, so uh, in terms of take home messages, um, as Sarah said, um, blood hypertension is known as the silent killer because many people, um, up to a third of the population, don't know that they've got blood pressure, high blood pressure. It may have no symptoms, and unless you get it checked, uh, then you may not know that you've got it. It's an important risk factor for heart disease, strokes, and other serious conditions, as we've discussed, and so it must be taken seriously. It's very treatable, though. Um, so, you, you know, if you are if you are if you are um, diagnosed with high blood pressure, then do take it seriously. Take the advice of a healthcare professional and see what you can do to help lower your blood pressure. We know that patients who've got high blood pressure who get COVID-19 are more likely to have a, a, a more severe infection and even more so if they're not taking their medication. So um, even more uh, reason to, to, to take the medication as prescribed. It's a very treatable condition. We can start with lifestyle factors and move on to medication if necessary. But even if patients are prescribed medication for their blood pressure, um, being serious about these lifestyle modifications will certainly help. And last of all, if you are diagnosed with high blood pressure, again, make sure that you take it seriously. You understand that it's um, blood pressures for high blood pressures for life and that you involve your family and speak to a healthcare professional. Um, so on the next slide, um, <clears throat> we've just put in a couple of resources if people um, want to have a look. Um, the British Hypertension Society has lots of good information about high blood pressure and how to manage it. And they can also advise on uh, getting a, a, a blood pressure machine to take your blood pressure at home. And these machines don't, don't cost very much money. Um, the NHS UK website is um, really good as a resource for um, finding out more about all sorts of conditions, including high blood pressure. Um, it's easy to read and um, it, it, it's very nicely laid out. If you're interested in the DASH diet, then um, we've put the link there. And um, the NICE guidelines for hypertension, uh, there is information for the public, um, so it's not all aimed at, at healthcare professionals but it's quite nice to have a look at that and see uh, what you can do to, to manage your, your blood pressure. Uh, so Saj and I would like to <clears throat> thank you very much for um, joining us on this webinar and uh, we'll, we'll hand you back to the organisers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Um, that was a really interesting and um, really good overview of blood pressure and why it's really important to, to be aware of your blood pressure, I think, taking your medication properly if you need to. But importantly as well, looking after your um, lifestyle factors, so activity, healthy eating, um, smoking. And um, for those of you that are aware of the webinar series, is, um, we have um, specific webinars on all of those topics in the weeks to come. So if you want to find out more about what you should be doing, what you can't be doing, what's available locally, what's there to help you, um, then yeah, please have a look at those two. And that information coupled with this really stands you in a good place to help the communities you're working with. Um, so I'm just looking at the, the chat box. Um, I think we're getting lots of thanks coming in, really interesting conversations and very informative. Haven't spotted any actual questions. Um, Marina, do you want to slide the slides onto the question slide? Um, there's some more resources there as well. Um, but yeah, if anybody's got any thoughts on how they-, hey, they Can might... I just say something, Stacey? Yeah. I'm going to tell you about a case that actually happened this morning. So this is a gentleman who's actually um, uh, rang me up this morning and he said to me, doctor, I've got really, really high blood pressure uh, to the extent he actually ended up calling NHS 111. Um, 
and uh, the, the paramedics checked his blood pressure and yes, it was slightly high. Um, and they said, okay, well, you know, you need to contact your GP. Now, what actually ended up happening with this gentleman is, he's been hypertensive for a number of years now, has been taking his medication, but actually after all, he stopped taking his tablets because he said, well, look, doctor, I was taking the medication, but my blood pressure got better, so I stopped taking them. But what he failed to recognize was, it was the tablets that was helping him control the medication. And I think this is what often happens sometimes with patients, that compliance is a big issue. And to an extent, all tablets will have a side effect, some more than others. Um, but the important thing is, is that the jobs that Alex and I do with our patients isn't about us just writing a prescription and just saying, look, this is how you need to take the tablet. It's about trying to understand some of the issues about why the blood pressure might be high with other things as well. And I think one of the things we're trying to push upon is self-empowerment. So you can imagine with everything happening with COVID, a fair number of my patients went out and did their blood pressure. I've got a blood pressure machine. So this patient, I've really high blood pressure. And I spoke to him today and I said, well, have you checked your blood pressure again? And he said, no, because uh, I've run out of batteries. So I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you go and get your batteries then and check your blood pressure again? So he came back, checked his blood pressure. It's absolutely normal. So the thing with blood pressure is, is Alex and I have tried to do a snapshot of what, why it's important. And actually it's one of those reversible factors if you've got the right treatment. Um, and we've talked about why it's important, particularly with this pandemic, because it's associated with worse outcomes, more so in BAME uh, communities as well. But certainly there has to be an empowerment at patient level. And I think the thing is, is I think what we need to cascade to communities is, is they need to take responsibility and this is one of these conditions where the ownership is happening on the patient, which is why they can get a blood pressure monitor. They make sure they take the medication. Um, Alex did a really good presentation, all the medications out there. And yet there's so much intricacies about the medications where one medication may fit one person, but not the others. And Alex, I don't know if, if you agree with me. A lot of the time when we do give these blood pressure medications, we tend to give two or three at a relatively low dosage to make them bearable. And this is why when you get conditions such as this, they end up on being on two or three drugs or even more because ultimately we're worried about cardiovascular death. But Alex, wouldn't that be the case that sometimes with these patients, you do end up giving them several agents to control their blood pressure in order for there to be a balance with them tolerating the side effects as well? Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's usually better to give uh, two medications at a lower dose than one at a higher dose. Um, to improve the side effect profile and to get a better better lowering of blood pressure. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I think that we've picked up the questions in the chat, the, the ones that needed answering and the rest is just a really big thank you to everybody. Um, the next slide is just an image um, promoting um, the COVID champion program that we have out there at the moment. So if you're working within a community um, and you want to have up-to-date information um, sent to you about, um, about COVID, the resources, um, guidelines, any, anything like that, plus all the resources that we have to help you and our partners that we're working with too. And we're looking for people who can spread the word in the communities with communities that they live and work with. So if you haven't already signed up, and I know there's some people on the webinar that have, but if you haven't, um, the web address to register is below. And possibly if we can, um, if everybody here can help to promote this as well, the more people we have out giving the correct messaging and um, the better outcomes Birmingham will, will have overall. So I think that's all from us. If you just flick to the next slide, Aruna, you'll see on there, there are um, links to the Be Healthy webinars and handouts. Um, also has the downloadable checklist, which will help you um, keep track of some of the things we've talked about today um, and ways that you can contact us for um, general inquiries. And if you have a COVID specific question, um, use the bottom email address and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Okay, I think that's um, all from us today. Um, uh, thank you for joining again and a big thank you to both of our speakers. We obviously can't do the, this webinar series without their, their time and commitment. So thank you very much. That's a pleasure. Hi everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.